Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Anyone who is seeking to walk with Christ and live for Him will quickly find that there are many pitfalls along our journey. The Christian life takes focus and dedication and a willingness to stick to the straight and narrow path and a willingness to repent when we fall off of it. And so today as we study 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we'll see the kinds of things that won't be on this path towards godliness. And so welcome to the Key Chapters podcast. I'm Russ Brewer, pastor of Wellington Community Church in Wellington, Colorado. And this is our daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of the Bible, one chapter at a time. And so as we go to chapter 6 here in 1 Corinthians, we're coming to the halfway point in this letter. Paul has been pointing the people to Christ and to a godly mindset. And chapter 6 speaks of a few ways that we can let worldly, fleshly thinking distract us from true biblical godliness. And so Paul opens chapter 6 by teaching momentarily about lawsuits between believers. Apparently, there was some kind of situation going on in their church where the people in the church were actually taking one another to court in lawsuits. And Paul is just shocked by this in verse 1. He's so shocked, he says that anyone would dare, that word dare is placed in the emphasis in Greek, he is shocked that anyone would dare to take a fellow believer to court. And what's worse in verse 1, they're going to court or to the law before the unrighteous and not before the saints. Paul's point is that these secular courts cannot understand the spiritual principles that underpin a true Christian community. And these judges, whoever these people might be, they won't be seeking a verdict according to kingdom values. And so the basic principle that we need to see here is that Christians ought not to take other Christians to court. By and large, we ought to be looking to other believers to help us settle matters of disputes between us and someone else in the church. And so over the next couple of verses, Paul is going to ask them two questions of an eternal nature. And his point is to show them that they need to be living lives in light of eternity. And so the first question is in verse two, where he says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And then he asks in verse three, do you not know that we will judge angels? And so his point is, is that in the future, in the millennial kingdom, when Christ has established his kingdom, Christ's people will have some role of authority. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us all that this is going to look like other than to say that we will have this role of authority in Christ's kingdom. And so therefore, if that's going to be our future, there ought to be godliness and godly people around us or maybe even ourselves so that we can weigh in on these matters and help adjudicate the situations that we might find going on in our own church lives. And so because of this, in light of this, Paul is shocked that they would give such authority to someone in the world who will not have this judicial role in the future. And he says this to shame them in verse 5. It's their shame for two reasons. First, in verse 5, that they don't have anyone wise enough in their church to rightly judge between brothers. And this is just tragic. And it goes back to the point that Paul made back in chapter 3, where he couldn't appeal to them as people who are spiritually mature, but as infants, because they were still thinking like the world. And here we're seeing that the church needs godly, wise, mature men and women just to help people deal with the various situations that might come up between believers and things like that. Second, as in terms of why this is to their shame, verse 7 says they've already been defeated by their sin and carnal thinking. And so Paul ends verse 7 saying, why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? In other words, why would you want to personally benefit in such a way that would bring your brother or sister harm? That's not a godly mindset. That's a carnal mindset. And the mindset of Christ is the mindset of a person who is not clinging to the things of this world. And if we are, if we're clinging to our own rights, if we're clinging to our own good name, if we're trying to protect what is rightfully ours, that is a sign that we are not putting our hope in the kingdom, which is still yet to come. And so the fact that they think they've won in this courtroom means in reality, they've already lost in the greatest courtroom of all. In fact, in verses 8 to 10, Paul then gives his readers a very serious warning. In verse 8, Paul is gearing up to challenge them to show them that their actions may indicate that they're not actually part of Christ's kingdom. And so then in verses 9 to 10, Paul gives them a list of the kinds of things that will not be a part of Christ's kingdom. Now, we saw a similar list back in chapter 5, verse 11. And here, Paul is saying, if someone is doing these things, that kind of behavior is not indicative of a true citizen of Christ's kingdom. And so verse 9 starts out by saying, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. And so maybe some other teacher came to this church and was saying that they could live any way they wanted. It doesn't really matter. But Paul is letting them know it does matter because their character shows who they truly are. And so they should not be deceived. 
those who live lives characterized by unrighteousness will not inherit Christ's kingdom. And Paul then gives them some of the kinds of things he's talking about. Now, these here, we need to understand, these are not single actions. These are a lifestyle. This is not a list of verbs, but rather basically nouns and some adjectives. And these terms are speaking to a person's identity. This is, this is who they are. And so what I'm going to do here as we go through this list is I'm going to read the item that Paul says, and then I'm going to explain at least why I think Paul is highlighting this specific character trait to indicate that a person who is doing this thing isn't yet on the way to heaven. Now, for the parents who are listening in, uh, we're getting to some pretty dicey language in the next few minutes. In fact, most of the podcast from here on out is going to have some language that may not be great for little ears. And so listener discretion is advised. With that, let's look at verse 9 here, starting with the word fornicator. The word fornicator is the Greek word porneia, which is the same word we were talking about yesterday in chapter 5. This word speaks of a wide range of sexual immorality. The person is given over to fornication. They're being mastered by these things. And they're displaying an inability to have the Holy Spirit crucify their sin. And that may mean they don't have the Holy Spirit after all. An idolater is someone who doesn't worship the Jesus of the Bible. This person would also be those who pray to a saint or anyone else. And likewise, since the Holy Spirit's purpose is to point us to Christ, if a person can worship someone else besides the true Jesus of the Bible, the Holy Spirit is probably not within them. An adulterer is someone who is married, but having sexual relations with someone who is not their spouse. This is robbery of another person's spouse. It's also a violation of the covenant the person made with their own spouse. And so if they cannot keep a covenant with their spouse, if they don't mind robbing someone else of their covenant, it's a good sign that person is not truly in covenant with the Lord. The next word is the word effeminate. And, and that's related to the word soft. And it was used specifically with sexual connotations. Now, this person doesn't like the gender God made them, and they want to, and they act like they're a different gender. Now, the next term, homosexual, is it's well talking about homosexuality. This person rejects God's creative design, and both homosexuality and the effeminate term here point back to Romans 1, and that Romans 1 condition where a person who is doing these things has been given over to their sin. Well, now, the list continues on in verse 10, which then mentions thieves. Um, these are those who are seeking to steal from and harm others, and this kind of behavior demonstrates an inability to trust God and rejoice in his provision. Uh, so does covetousness. The next word, the covetous person is a person who is envious of what other people have. They're not trusting God for their provisions. They're fixing their hope, their gaze on things of this world, not on the things of the world to come. Drunkards are those who give themselves over to inebriation, and that would include in our day and age, any mind-altering substances. Ephesians 5.18 calls us to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit, not of wine. And when a person puts themselves under the control of these substances, they're obviously not under control of the Holy Spirit. Now, revilers are those who would seek to harm others with their words. And a person who is just willing to hurt someone else with their words is, is not being ruled by the love of the Holy Spirit. Swindlers, same kind of idea, those who trick and deceive. And anyone who is willing to contend to deceive and trick other people for personal gain is not loving others with the love of Christ. Now, this is a powerful list, and we could pause the podcast right now, and, and maybe we should, to prayerfully consider if any of these qualities are true of us. But that's the key point. Are these true of us right now? Paul goes on to tell us, I love this verse in verse 11. Paul goes on to say, such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. And I love this verse because it gives us this tremendous hope that none of us are locked in our sinful ways. If we're engaging in any one of these activities, we can set that activity down and repent of it and come to Christ for forgiveness and be washed of these sins and be justified and then walk in our new life in Christ. Now, having settled this and continuing on to the chapter here, Paul then anticipates the kinds of responses he'll probably be hearing from some of the readers. And, and I think he's quoting from several popular sayings that may have been just kind of floating around this church. Maybe they were brought in by some roaming teacher. And so in verse 12, Paul says, all things are lawful for me. And this seems to be the saying that he's quoting here because he cites it twice in this verse, later on also in chapter 10, verse 20. But look, he quickly grounds it in truth. And so he says, basically, you say all things are lawful for me, but I say not all things are profitable. You say all things are lawful for me, but I say I will not be mastered by anything. In other words, those who are flaunting their Christian freedoms are not recognizing that our freedom is not freedom to sin, but freedom to pursue holiness by the grace and the power of God. And if they're still running after sin, 
that is a serious sign that they're still being enslaved to sin. We're going on to verse 13. Verse 13 goes on to say, food for the stomach and stomach for the food, but God will do away with both of them. Again, this is probably just a phrase where Paul is quoting what's being said there, and then he corrects it. And so it seems as though the Corinthians were trying to put everything into a morally neutral category, as if they're saying that since food is morally neutral, and since we're no longer bound by the Old Testament law, therefore everything is morally neutral. Um, maybe that, or, or maybe they were saying that since the body will be destroyed anyway, anything we do in this world stays in this world, so do whatever you want. But once again, Paul corrects this wrong thinking. He says, yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And so Paul is correcting this wrong thinking, saying that there are still moral categories with God and we are not to use our bodies for immorality, but rather for the Lord's work. Even going on to verse 14, when the Corinthians were saying that food is meant for the stomach and the stomach is meant for food and God will destroy them both. Again, this idea like, you know, God's going to destroy it all anyway. Just do whatever you want. But in verse 14, Paul is saying, they've got all that wrong. Yes, we will die, but we will be raised again. And just as there's a correspondence between the pre-resurrection body of Jesus and his post-resurrected body, there will also be a correspondence between who we are today and who will be in Christ's kingdom. Let us not think that what we do in this world does not matter in the next world. It does. And so let us live in light of that day. And so as we go on, Paul then gives us a specific tie-in in verses 15 to 20 about prostitution. Verse 15 begins with another one of Paul's questions. And so for the fourth time, he asks, do you not know? And each time he's implying that they should know and they should be living in light of these realities. And so Paul asks him in verse 15, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. And so he's reminding them that they are united with Christ and therefore they bring Christ with them wherever they go into every relationship they have. We should always remember this, that, that Jesus is going with us wherever we go, whatever we're doing, he's with us. Whatever we're watching, he's there too. Christ never leaves us. He is always with us, which then has major implications if we choose to venture into realms of immorality. And therefore, in verse 16, if they were to engage in sexual relations with somebody else, they are then engaging in the kind of relationship that was designed by God to create one flesh. And so if a person was doing this with a prostitute, they're bringing Christ into that relationship with them. That's obviously not righteous and holy. And so instead, the believer should be united to the Lord, body, soul, spirit, and therefore be pure and holy in every aspect of life, again, in body, soul, and spirit. And if that's the case, then in verse 18, the believer should flee all forms of sexual immorality because when we engage in immorality, we're bringing Christ into those situations with us. That's obviously not okay. And then in verses 19 to 20, since our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, we can't say that a sin is just something here and now. It has an impact on our relationship with the Lord. And not only that, but our body and soul have been bought by the Lord to be redeemed from this creation when he returns to establish his kingdom. Therefore, Christ owns our body, even our body, because that will be resurrected as well. And so therefore, let us do all we can right now with our bodies to glorify God, because that will matter for all eternity. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And this chapter covers a lot from lawsuits to moral purity to the kinds of things that show if a person is not yet born again. This chapter covers a lot of issues about the path towards godliness. And so for a final wrap up, let's just keep these principles in mind as we go throughout the rest of our day. The Christian life is a journey on the straight and narrow path. And yet the world gives us plenty of temptations to fall off of it. And what we do here now matters to God. God is always with us, whether it's a lawsuit with a believer or something we're watching, God is always with us and he wants us to be pure and he will crucify our flesh so that we're not mastered by any sin. And yet when we do fall into sin, we don't have to stay in that sin. We could repent and we can come to the Lord and we could be washed and we could be sanctified so that we would walk down a path where we glorify God in our mind and our body. So we'll wrap things on up there. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great rest of your day. God bless.